director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center of the Consulate General of India in Durban, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, Ms. Gasinia uh, Mshlope, Mr. Toki Mahato, Mr. Piyush Kandawal, Mr. Sipiwayam Chunu, distinguished guests, online viewers, Namaskar and welcome to episode 9 of Uhambo Ulami, My Journey. Indeed, today we will be interacting with the very beautiful, dynamic Ms. Gersinia Mshlope, who is an author, poet, playwright, director, performer and storyteller. She's, um, I, uh, she was influenced by her grandmother's tales when she was a child. Ms. Uh, Mshlope's written uh, uh, performance talent has transported her from South Africa to South and North America to Europe, Greenland, Japan. She has performed her stories in theatre like Royal Albert Hall Kennedy Center in the US and collaborated with the Ladysmith Black Mombazo on, on a children's a CD. She again worked with the Ladysmith Black Mombazo and the Francis Bebe Quartet in a unique production. Africa at the Opera, which toured opera houses in Germany. Indeed, sit back and relax and enjoy this interesting interaction we have with Ms. Uh, Jessenia uh, Mshlope by Mr. Toki Mohoto, a social activist and author based in Durban, South Africa. The Consulate General of India, using the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, welcomes Mam Dr. Tinam Shope here on Uhambolwami, My Journey. We are on episode nine. My name is Toki Mohoto. Welcome, Dr. Tinam Shope. It's, it's been a long time we're trying to secure this appointment with Dr. Tinam Shope. It attests to her being a national treasure and being called almost anywhere and everywhere. And we felt it fit to invite a cultural icon, a heritage manager, and a great ambassador for Africa's development and human evolution in its entirety. This conversation is going to be touching on her life story, as well as her journey, as well as an icon, as well as telling maybe youngsters how to go about approaching the art sector and who you are definitely becomes what you say to the world, but most importantly, how you live and how you express the brand that you were created to become. Without any further ado, Mam Tinam Shope kindly narrate the few glimpses of stories which have culminated into the icon that you are. For me, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here with you. <laughs> um, I grew up in a very privileged place, growing up with a grandmother who told stories all the time. And uh, when you have a very, very curious person like me, it's either you donate her to somebody else or you behave like my grandmother did. When I came with all of these questions, she said, in fact, I do have a story about that. Mm -hmm. She told me a story and then another story and another. And she was sharpening my imagination to travel to far away places, to go below the ocean, to go above the clouds, inside a baobab tree. I could go deep into the caves in the Drakensberg. I could go anywhere at all. I could walk into the, the rock of two holes with Dema and Demazana so much. And then also uh, she gave me another gift, sharpening the art of listening. It is something very special when you train your child to know and appreciate that listening is a skill on its own. The third thing my grandmother or my whole childhood did was teach me the importance of the beauty of your own mother tongue. When you look at our mother tongues, it doesn't matter what language you speak, the beauty of it, the way you can actually taste the words, the way you express exactly what you feel, because it's your mother tongue. You sucked it from your mother's breast. Yes. That's why we say, yes. because you sucked it from your mother's breast. And the beauty of our language is the musicality of it. And um, I, I carried all of that into the classroom. And I continued when I went to live in the Eastern Cape again. I found that I can't speak it because I'm lost and I was in a place with the, all these mountains on either side. I'm, I'm really, really stuck. But I thought there's something that can save me. It's called a book. <laughs> Hold on to the book. I don't care how fast the, the river is flowing, trying to sweep me away because I've got this sense of not belonging. But I held on to the book. I got into the classroom. I thought, if there's anything else that I know for sure, I'm good in the classroom. Yeah. 
So I focused on my reading, I focused on my academic achievement, and I never looked back, and I loved being number one. I thought, I'm loving this, and, and excelling. So I think um, moving to the Eastern Cape and feeling displaced at the age of 10, I, I think the Almighty wanted to polish me a little bit. Uh, when you, I, I think all, I, we were not rich here in Hammersdale in KZN, but we were okay. Yes. Now you arrive in the Eastern Cape, you staring poverty, poverty in the face. And I think the Almighty knew that I was going to be diamond when I grow up. So I just needed a bit of polishing, a bit of appreciation, what um, poverty looks like, what not having feels like, what um, understanding that uh, whatever little you have, it's worthy, it's something special, and having a, a stronger relationship with Mother Earth. My grandmother had vegetables. She planted this and she had the banana trees and there were, there were the flowers as well. She had all these flowers in the garden. But when I went to the Eastern Cape, <gasps> whole fields of um, corn, millies and millet and pumpkins and beans and you name it. And in the month of March towards April, we call that time a Gwindla. Nobody ever goes hungry in Gwindla. Yeah. This is the time when the first fruits appear and the first beans, and then the first pumpkins, and the first this, there is so much food. And then the millies, when it's still very, very soft, you cut it off the cob, and you grind it with a grinding stone, and you make beautiful steamed bread. In fact, I made it the other day at my house. Not mpokoko, mpokoko is something else, but this one you make is steamed bread. Mpokoko is for amasi. And for eating with, with the, with the, with the uh, curdled milk, amasi. So all of those things, I learned so many things. Even knowing how to grind with a grinding stone. Yes. <laughs> the little fingers get hurt. But after a while, you get to know how to do it. So my journey took me to different places. But I never fell out of love with my language. I never fell out of love with the importance of reading, yes. of, of acquiring knowledge, and always being hungry for, for knowledge and being curious. Curious, curious. Briefly, we spoke about how many people were a bit perturbed when you decided to go full time into storytelling. What was the inspiration also linked to that? What inspires you when you're about to create or engage in storytelling? You, you see, my, my um, moving into the creative arts came from accepting my voice. Because I thought, oh, this double bass, what am I going to do with this double bass? I prayed a lot in church. I thought the Almighty is going to hear me, and then the angel will come through, break the ceiling, touch my throat, and I was going to have a sweet womanly voice. Never happened. But the minister at my school told me that my voice is not ugly. He said, my voice is resonant. I didn't know what resonant meant. I thought, the way he said it, I can live with that. And um, I wrote my first poem a few months after that. And I stood up under the gum trees at the school where I was, boarding school. I was not interested so much in going to watch the rugby at the sports field with the other girls and what. Me, I was under the trees reading, reading, and I wrote my first poem. I stood up, I read it out loud. I thought, okay, that's it. Is that what he means, resonant? Does it mean that my poems should be said and performed out loud to preserve the heritage of my people? And so I found my voice on that day. I fell in love with myself on that day, and I never stopped writing. And I thought I was going to become a writer, maybe to say my poetry out loud, but that was it. I never thought of myself going to the spaces I've ended up going. I have been invited to write for magazines as a journalist. I've been invited to read news for BBC Africa Service Radio, for Radio Netherlands and ZBC. So I learned how to use my voice as well as a, as a news reader. And that's extremely important to know how to breathe, how to present the, the article that you're reading and finish and start on the next subject and know that the audience is not going to rewind if you don't pronounce words properly, all of that. And then I got to perform some of my poetry during the years of struggle at political rallies and all of that. And that's where I got an invitation to act in the first ever theater play I did with Maisha Maponya, and it was called Umongi Gazi, The Nurse. I got a lead role in this play. I was still working for Lenin and Teach magazine, so we were rehearsing at night, and I was working as a journalist during the day. <gasps> let's go, let's go, let's go. So the joys of being young, yeah, I would yeah. say, is the joys of being young, because you can do all those super long hours, and the next morning, 8 o'clock, you're back at the office. 
and um, when we traveled for the first time overseas, I was amazed by the interest of the anti-apartheid movement in our struggle. Yes, yes. But also it meant that I met people from other countries who were fighting for freedom. In many countries in Asia, countries in South America, in, 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 in Guatemala, in Chile, found out about people like Victor Jara, the freedom fighter. I met, uh, found out about Rico Betamenchu, people in Bolivia, musicians from, from, from um, Northern Ireland, people who came from um, different places where they were oppressed in different, and it woke me up to the fact that we, as South Africans, we're, the only, we're not the only oppressed people in the world. There was a bigger community out there of people who were um, chased away from their homes because they were fighting for freedom. So our political um, expression uh, in the theater world, whether it is through songs or poetry or dance or, 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 or theater pieces, we were always talking about uh, the, 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 the pain of the oppressed people. And we talked about all of these things and even when journalists were banned, we were the ones who were the voice of our people out there. So you couldn't just be, I'm an actress, I'm an actress. No, no, no. You've got to be a political activist. We were cultural ambassadors wherever we went. The likes of Mama Miriam Makeba paved the way for us. Brahim Masigela or Babu Abdullah Ibrahim, Dudu Pukwana. All of those amazing, amazing musicians, they, they, they led the way for us. And so we understood that we were cultural ambassadors everywhere we went. So when I wrote Have You Seen Zandile, people thought it was too feeble. Yes, yes. Because it's, just, it's not extreme political. There's no Amanda, there's no Viva. But it was a story that was very universal. A story that had to be told according to where I was in my life. Yes, yes. And then... I directed Zandile in Chicago, I came back and then I was invited again to go and direct him. Have you seen Zandile with African Americans in Knoxville, Tennessee? So the play was going and going in different countries, came back to South Africa and I was um, offered a resident directorship at the Market Theatre, accepted and in fact that's where I, uh, I cut my teeth at the Market Theatre in the theatre space and made many, many contacts around the world. But the friction that happened a year later after I had been um, nominated as the, 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 the first black woman resident director, mm -hmm. so much publicity, <laughs> um, meant that um, I left um, the theatre world, jumped ship in 1991, went into full-time storytelling, mm -hmm. and um, it was the best thing I ever did. Yeah. I felt like I'm straightening up and I'm flying right. I'm feeling my wings. My, my wings were always sprouting, sprouting, and then they unfurled. I took to the skies. I got to meet so many people. I got to interact with so many people. The versatility of this thing called storytelling is out of this world. And so I have worked with philharmonic orchestras because of storytelling. I've worked with the likes of Francis Bibi from Cameroon because of storytelling. I have worked with the uh, Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra because of storytelling. I have done storytelling in places like Argentina. I have been to Jaipur in India because of storytelling. And so my storytelling and my, my literature, because I'm, a, I'm an author, I've written 18, 19 books so far, all of these books. So for me, the right hand side of me is the author. The left hand side of me, close to my heart, is the storyteller. Mm -hmm. So when you look at all the achievements in the past 37 years of my, of my uh, professional adult life, I will say to you the two things you can be guaranteed I will mention when you ask me, so what's your line of work? What do you do? I'm an author, storyteller. All the other things fall under that. Yes, yes. I'm always an author, storyteller. I'm never confused. Some people, when I went into full-time storytelling, were worried. They thought, oh, she's going to have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Who's ever heard of a professional storyteller? In, people in South Africa just didn't know that was possible. And other people were thinking, oh, she's on ganja. <laughs> oh, maybe she's uh, smoking cocaine. <laughs> and so people were very worried about me. And I thought, don't you get worried. For me, I'm answering a call. I'm being called by the ancestors and I'm answering. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to preserve the heritage of my people through storytelling and I've never looked back. Yes, yes. Another question would be, having, having had an illustrious career, how do you then comprehend the success of an artist? Does it require popularity 
or quality does it require the two simultaneously or where do you feel a popularity or the success of an artist can be defined? That's a very important question because um, for me to answer that question, I have to come to this thing that I repeat very often. I say to people, you need to know the why, why you're doing something. If you don't know why you're doing something, it's like somebody who stands at the, at the, the side of the road, a busy, busy road, and then you're hitchhiking, you're hitchhiking, a car stops, and then the driver says, hey, where are you going? Anywhere. Yeah. Sure, that's dangerous. <laughs> hey, you might lose your life if you're going anywhere. Yeah. The same thing applies to somebody who cannot answer the why they are doing what they are doing. So for me, being clear as to why I'm doing what I'm doing, with all the awards I've received, we've just had visitors at my house last week and they had, how many awards? I don't know how many awards. There's a lot of awards in that house. So all of these awards that I've received from different parts of the world and, and in South Africa and nowadays is the Lifetime Achievement Award again and again, Lifetime. Like, let's stop the river of awards, please. Can we just sponsor the organization so that I continue with my job? Can we just stop the river? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Let's stop the river of awards because many of them don't come with one cent. Yeah, and so it is important to, to, to celebrate your achievements. I have achieved a lot, but that's not what I'm thinking about because there's still more to do. There's not enough hours in the day. There's not enough days in the week. There's definitely not enough time in the month or the year. So there's so much to do. And for us who are conscious of making a contribution in society, Oh, oh, we, we were very clear about why we are doing what we, what we are doing. And no matter how successful I become, I, I'm, I'm never feeling good saying, oh, deal, and now I'm, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. And that must be a disappointment as well to, to some of the young people who come to want to meet me. Oh, the excitement. And I'm not a celebrity. Mm -hmm. So they get very disappointed. A good time. This is just me, mother of crazy. OK, that's, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's boring for them. So, but, but there are people who love being celebrities. They can go and hang out with them. Me, I've got lots of work to do. Mm -mm. We've seen in South Africa that there's been a cry from artists to say the sector is not adequately funded or supported. How much influence do you feel that your genre has in terms of either uh, changing the way society sees itself or allowing society to evolve beyond the limitations that are imposed to us? In the creative arts, there's not enough funding. Really, really. It's almost like they, they sit at, in parliament and they decide, ah, they, these are the stepchildren of South Africa, so we can give them a little bit of money <laughs> and um, they, they should be satisfied. Yeah, yeah. And then when you look at the hierarchy of this thing called the creative arts, they think the creative arts is the musicians at the top. Yeah. That's the creme de la creme. And everybody else falls underneath. And they're the very bottom under the shoes of all the fancy people is the storytelling. Yeah. Under the shoes. Now I say to you, take, get this. The story is the mother of all art forms. If you're a fashion designer, you need to have a story as to why you are designing the type of clothing that you're designing. Yeah. If you're a jewelry maker, there's got to be a story. You need to bear resemblance to the mother, which is the storyteller. The story. If you're a composer, if you want your song to last for, for, for hundreds of years, there are songs that are, rem are remembered over and over and over for many years. It's a story that makes the, 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 the song to be a classic. Yes. Piece of fine art, fine art. Gerard Sikoto, many people never even met him because of the story. Baba Azari Ambata, story. Malangatana from Mozambique, story. You understand? Francis Bebe, Cameroon, story. So a, a lot of it, the poetry that narrates and takes you to places, Pablo Neruda from Chile in South America. When I think of Pablo Neruda, he takes you places with his writing. Rumi, the Persian poet, he takes you places. So all of that, this is the lack of understanding in our government and people or the powers that be, that story is the mother of all art forms. Once we wake up to that, everything can change. Yeah, it's quite true. Can you tell us about your important achievements? I know you've got quite a lot, but which ones do you look back on and say, had it not been for the gift I have, I wouldn't have been recognized for this, or humanity would not have come to know itself better because of me? I think uh, the first <laughs> international award was the OB Award in New York. I was uh, performing Born in the RSA, 
And uh, when I was nominated for the Obi Award, I was excited, but uh, I didn't exactly think I was going to win. I mean, really, <laughs> who do you think you are? <laughs> and you think of the other people that were nominated with me. And um, uh, so I, 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 I stayed in Boston because after that, after the nomination, I got a contract with the Brandeis University. Yeah. And I worked at Brandeis for six months and finished my contract with Barney Simon. I was his assistant director. And we came back to South Africa. And then finally, there was going to be the announcement of the OB Award. And I chose not to go to New York. I thought, oh, you can imagine the cameras. The South African <laughs> did not win, but she's smiling so gracefully. So I didn't go. And Dumandovo accepted my award for me. Wow. I could not believe that I, Tsunam Klope, won the OB Award. And then you look at the, um, the awards we got for Heavy Seeds and Dile, starting with the Fringe first in Edinburgh Festival. When we did Heavy Seeds and Dile, you find that um, people who used to sympathize with us or empathize, whatever you call it, identify with us because we were doing political plays. When they saw Heavy Seeds and Dile, because it's very personal, it's very, very autobiographical, total strangers, men and women, they would come and hold me tight. And they would start telling me stories. If I had a lapel mic and I was recording all the stories, people told me, I wonder how many stories I would have. And, and, and because when you talk about a story that is universal like that, it's like the story of Anne Frank. You know, that's universal. You, you, talk, you talk about it. What is another, another story that's very, very famous? Uh, go tell it on the mountain. There's another one. And then you've got AC Jordan in Mumbai, Universal. You know, the, and, and so the same thing with um, Have You Seen Zandile? It's, it, it's been running since um, 1985 and it's performed every year. I'm amazed by the privilege. And then I also got another award, which, you know, the, the Joseph Jefferson Award, I, I really did not expect that. I remember the, 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 the people who came to see the show in Chicago and then the actors rushed into the dress, in dressing room. <gasps> we got the Jeff! We got the Jeff! I'm like, I don't know what's the Jeff. Can we get ready, please? Can we just warm up our voices and go on stage? Because I don't know what's the Jeff. But it turns out to be nominated for the Joseph Jefferson Award. And the, the interest, the excitement, and all of that. So all of these things are getting the freedom of the city of Chicago as well. <laughs> that was something, getting the key. And also another award that I won... Um, the, the, the more recent one is the SAFTA Award. And even though I don't work in the film space so often, mm -hmm. or on television that much, I've worked on television over the years, but I stepped back from television because I do a lot of live performances. Yeah. I travel a lot internationally. And so TV, I can't do full-time television. I just, yeah. you no, know, I'm sorry. And, and most of the time I find that it's more fame than cash. So can we just do some work, especially the, the amount of, of, of community work that I have to do? Yes. So we've done that. Uh, or receiving uh, another award that was very interesting was, um, what was it called? Uh, the Prestige Award. The Prestige Award, um, uh, several newspapers in Johannesburg came together and the, the, the corporates or Nestle, or Barney, they came together and they gave this very important award for 10 women who had contributed a lot. When I got the prestige award, I was just humbled. I could not believe it. Oh, Usiba, our Minister of Arts and Culture, the inaugural Usiba Award, I was one of the recipients. I was um, very honored as well to receive that. But when you think of all the awards, my goodness, there's a lot of awards. Yes, yes. I don't know how many awards really. One day we should sit down and count. We should sit down and count. Yes. I've been very, very lucky. But I think... Um, the people I have interacted with or collaborated with or worked with or seen, or seen the stories that I, I do being interpreted into song or into dance productions, that for me has been unbelievable. A privilege that you cannot emphasize enough. We live in a country where a great number of young people resonate with the creative arts sector, but either due to budget limitations, due to it not being taught adequately at schools or parents not supporting them, we find that a lot aren't giving themselves the time and potential that they have into it being nourished so that they become fully-fledged creatives. What inspiration or word of advice would you give to upcoming artists? I believe that the creative arts should be very, very much a part and parcel of the curriculum 
in, in schools. The power of arts in education cannot be overemphasized. I think the biggest mistake the current government did was removing sport from the schools and removing uh, spirituality from the schools and removing the creative arts from schools. There's hardly any money for the creative arts. When you think of choirs in schools, when you think of uh, the, the athletics and the different, or oh, agriculture, hello? Children don't know how to just plant a seed in the ground. So things like that, that made education more rounded. And then they came up with these things, the, the outcomes-based education, and then where you tick boxes and like, how many boxes can you tick? Just unbox our children, please, somebody. Just unbox our children, give them a wholehearted education. And a lot of it has meant that children don't know how to operate outside the classroom. And then it also um, made um, the parents to step back because they don't know what on earth is being taught. And there's too much homework sent to the schools and um, to the parents, sorry, sent to the parents. And the parents, I don't know what you're being taught. I've never heard of this thing. <laughs> I, I really, it's almost like parents now are stupid. Yeah. Parents are not stupid. It's the type of education that has been brought into our lives. And there's a lack of the holistic um, um, approach to, to, to education and the same applies to up and coming artists who are some of them naturally gifted mm -hmm. naturally gifted like many of us hardly had any training whatsoever we jumped into the creative arts and hard work hard work hard work I find that now um, there's this thing of the idols and the x-factor and what is the other one their voice other children think that the, the, the microwave approach to the creative arts is, is good enough. Yeah. I can stand there, look almost naked, and then sing. Mm -hmm. we, we sympathize with Beyonce, we know she's not paid enough, that's why she doesn't have wear many, many clothes. But can we just have some people <laughs> just get on stage and sing, put on your clothes, yeah. just fully dressed? Your voice can come out, you know, really can, your voice can come out. Um, so I think um, we need to bring back the, 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 the power and the, the, um, the respect of our own cultures, mm. to know that every culture is different. Yeah. You know, I, when I look at you wearing this hat, I work with a lot of elders in different parts of South Africa. Our literacy campaign, Nozi Nwadi, has meant that we traveled all nine provinces of South Africa. I was um, launching libraries, visiting libraries in, in, in the Free State province. In Puta de Chaba, the elders found out that mm. I'm coming. And I arrived um, the night before, and then in the morning when we got there around about 8.30, the elders are, are there. By the time the teachers and the learners come, all the elders are there. They've brought African beer. Wow. They've brought food, traditional beer. They are dressed up in, in their own Basutu um, attire. And they've got gifts for me. Bari umuzulu, imba ukrinawaruna. Again, ukrinawaruna. Now you understand that in different provinces, in Pumalanga province, you might be from Guazulu Natal, but you belong to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go to another province, people say, you are ours. Mm -hmm. I no longer belong to that Mthlope family in Hammersdale, or here in Durban, or I belong to the whole of South Africa. The continent uh, is, is my, my, my home. Mother Africa is my home. And everywhere I go, I fly the flag of this country. So when you are conscious of that so everything you create every poem every song every piece of clothing everything you you have, you have a sense that um, you are representing a very important people you know when you look at uh, people like um, <laughs> um there's a production that's going to be performing as from tomorrow it's called uh, the what's it called uh, the nutcracker it's an old fairy tale from way back when how many times do we do that in South Africa? I would like Fudugaz's magic. I've performed Fudugaz's magic in Germany. I've performed Fudugaz's magic in France. I've done it in Holland. I've done it in America. I would like Fudugaz's magic to be done with a Philharmonic Orchestra. You understand? Like Peter and the Wolf. Yes, yes. And have all the different indigenous musical instruments and all of that. So it's up to us to do that, to make our, um, our stories, our songs, our heritage, to have a long life. You see? 
One of the things um, that I would like to play with in the coming year, maybe it will be the second half of the year, because the first half we've got a lot of work to do, especially with people in the, um, in the space where we have got blind people, we've got uh, deaf people, we've got people who've got all kinds of disabilities, but I love Musa Zulu. He says, this ability. It's not disability, he says, this ability that I have. I love that. You see, I would like to work with at least 12 musicians to do different songs that come from fairy tales, from our own uh, folk tales. When you think, um, if I stand at an event in Gauteng or I'm in the Northwest province or wherever, I start, Snanapo, Snanapo, Ambulayile, Snanapo, Amfamasapo, Snanapo, Nagawakana, Snanapo, Akijimut. Everybody starts singing with me because it's one of our folk tales. They are there, but they are shocked that I know that song. And then I'm, I'm, I'm in a place where people speak a certain language. Demazana, demazana ga mama, ah, she's giving a, so she's giving a, giving a, di vulele, di vulele, di gene. We open that rock so I can come in, my sister. It's the story of Dema and Demazana, Masilo and Masilonyana. You've got all of these stories and the story of the brave ox, Badon. When I sing that song and then I stop and I say, I want all the men to sing in the audience. And then the men stand up and they, 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 they prepare their voices and then they sing. And then the, their wives and their daughters and the world are looking. You mean you can sing? And I love that. I love that. So our stories have got these songs and these songs are the kind of magic that cements a story into your brain or the chant that made you remember a certain story. Which one? That's the one. Because there is a chant. There is something, there's magic in there. That those are the songs that cement our stories into our memory. So 2022, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that. And so that by the time we reach the, the, the month of October, which is my birthday month, but also the month when we celebrate our storytelling festival in Durban, yes. and we are hoping that we're going to have all of these storytellers from different parts of the world, from India and from um, Madagascar, from Reunion Islands, people are coming from, from Uganda, from Kenya, uh, from the US and Canada, South America. When all of these people arrive in South Africa, we want to fly the flags to have a parade at the beachfront, to be proud. When we go to other countries, the way we dress up. Yeah, true. When we come out of the elevator, if you are at reception, you feel like the flowers are pouring out of the elevator because we know who we are. Yeah. We are proud of the people that we are. And it's extremely important then for us to honor the stories of our people, whatever culture you come from, you see? It's extremely important. One of my favorite people here in Durban, I miss her, I really, really miss her, was Mama Fatima Mir. Yes, yes, yes. Mama Fatima Mir was um, a great mind and a great spirit, freedom fighter, a lover of her people. And um, you were never in her presence and not feel better. It doesn't matter what you were feeling when you woke up in the morning, but when you sat with Mama Fatima Mir, you felt better. And that's something special. Yeah. You know, I've had the privilege of knowing in that Eskiam Patele, same story. An amazing, amazing person who nourished you, made you feel better. Ubabunja Debele, that's my brother. And then you've got um, people like Bradon Matera. So all of these, these amazing, amazing people. Ubabu Albisex. I mean, these are people who make you feel better. Yes. And very often, we don't talk about them and when young people don't know about them, we criticize them. How can you criticize people when you haven't taught them anything? You can't go to a garden, a, a parking lot, and say, there are no sweet potatoes here. What's the problem? The, you, you till the land, remove the concrete, plant the sweet potatoes. Then you can come back and harvest. Same thing applies to our oral history and written history and recorded audiovisual history. All of it, share it with our people. It's up to us to do that. Yeah. Definitely. Do you feel that technology has, has enhanced the way art is produced or somewhat it has presented some limitations which then uh, pit the consumer as well as the producer against each other? 
Technology is not something to be feared. Technology is something to be embraced because it comes to the party, to something that is solid, that is strong, that is very, very important. I don't know if you've ever been to an oral history museum anywhere in the world. Yes, I have. Yeah? I love memory houses. And I'm working towards opening an oral history museum as part of our project as, a, as, a, as an organization. I've been to Gore in Senegal. I've been to the one in, in Medellin in Colombia. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful space to be. You're going back in time. I've been to Uruguay in Montevideo to visit the memory house there. And the big coup <laughs> is that um, they got the house where the last dictator of Uruguay used to live. And that's where the memory house is. That's amazing, isn't it? I think um, the, the technology that we have, all of these gadgets should come in handy. You see, Nollywood started with, with cell phones. They, they didn't have the money to be making the, the movies with the big cameras and what. They didn't have any of that, but they wanted to tell their stories. Where there is a will, there is a way. So we must do the same then with our, our, our stories, our songs, our dance and what, and, and project images and what. There's so much for us to share with one another. But don't rely on technology like a crutch. Yes, yes. Never lose the connection, person-to-person -person connection. Once we lose that, then the, the gadgets are just gadgets. Definitely. They're going to sit there looking at you. You've got nothing to say. Yeah. yeah. So the same thing, there's something that... Um, Maybe we'll talk about it another time, this element of animation. Yes, yes. Animation in the African continent has to blossom. Yes. It has to blossom. So we, I know it's very expensive. If they don't give us money for ordinary small things, where we've got to find a way of getting sponsorship for animation because we need to do animation films as well in this country. And look at the universality of this thing called animation. Yes. Yeah, quite true. You're quite an accomplished individual, an icon, as well as a social cultural contributor. Do you feel that your popularity has made the consumption of your work easy in as far also maybe as far as reaching people who can enhance your work, whether it be monetarily, in whatever way, or do you feel that your popularity somewhat presents some barriers in certain respects? My popularity is very different from the popularity of DJ so-and-so or a great musician and all of that. People who are, admire me are people who love um, reading, who love writing, are people who love story, people who love history. Those are the type of people who love me. That's a very different kind of people. Yes, yes. Even when I'm walking in a shopping center and people recognize me, it's not the kind of people who would go to Zakes Mountain, yeah! You don't have to scream when you see me. <laughs> so I, I, I like, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that kind of, of popularity. And um, I think when it comes to the sales of my books or my CDs or, or the, the films I've acted in, the popularity has worked in my favor, yeah. but sometimes I feel like the lack of availability. You see, publishing houses don't market books the way they should. I don't know how many writers' conferences I kept repeating. Can we get a red pen and underline marketing in the dictionary, hand it over to the publishing houses? Because they don't publicize our books. They don't market our books, publish them and do the launch, and then people know it's out, and then it's nowhere to be found. Yeah. No matter how many times people want to buy our books, they're not easily available. At many of, um, of our events, I have to bring my books. And people buy them, and then they are finished, and then order more books, and then buy them, and then finish. Like, why am I a bookseller now? <laughs> am I not supposed to be a writer? Oh, yes. Yeah? So there's a lack of promotion of our work, and um, I think we've got to find ways of... Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a group of young women in Johannesburg, I've forgotten now their name, but they've got a book, Stockfell. I'm so proud of them. I'm so, so proud of them for starting a book stock fell yes. because of that, co that co-op of bringing people together and sharing titles and books and reading together is something that's, that's so special. In the same way that it, it uh, empowered women when they started stock fells with money yes. um, and helping each other with the, with the saving and, and, and contributing to the GDP of our country. So we can contribute to the GDP of our heritage. Same thing must happen.
What is your appraisal of the current landscape, artistic landscape of South Africa vis-a-vis -vis the countries you've been to? We can look at it from how government invests in it, how citizens consume it, and how artists or creatives appreciate what they are, what their role are, is in society. Let's start with bookstores. Bookstores are hardly visited unless people are looking um, to a bookstore that sells uh, books for children for schools. Yes, yes. Yeah? To just say, let's go find a book. P people hardly do that. Many times people uh, buy books um, by chance, mm -hmm. except to the diehard readers like us. Yeah. Um, then I, I think there's something that is, that is special in other countries. In Europe, I saw a children's bookstore fully fledged, decorated like you won't believe, mm. like you're going to an Edgar's or something. Yeah, yeah. The window dressing and the couches and the toys and it, it, out of this world, a children's bookstore. Mm. The reason why I wrote my first book ever, that was called uh, The Snake with Seven Heads. Mm. I wrote that book because I had been overseas and I was jealous. I bought a whole children's bookstore. Who's ever heard of a children's bookstore in my country? We can actually do that. There are many, many people that have written and continue to write for children. We can have children's bookstores yes. or any other bookstore for that matter and make them attractive that a person is walking past. What is that? I, no, man, I must go in. No, I, I can buy the shoes next time. Let's walk into that shop. And so it's extremely important for us to promote our artwork. Yes. Um, and then the same thing applies to whether it's music or fine art. Our art galleries are not fully sponsored mm -hmm. the way art galleries are sponsored in other countries. Where also the multidisciplinary collaboration happens, it's extremely important. I have performed in some of the most amazing bookshops or art galleries in different parts of the world. And one of my favorites that I will always, always remember for as long as I live is um, being part of the Koraini Gallery in, um, in Mantova. Mantova is about two hours west of um, Milan in Italy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, this place is run by this couple that loves the creative arts. Even the books they published. When one of my books was published by them, it was a work of art. Massimo did illustrations, illustrated my book in glass. Wow. I mean, wow. When I arrived in Mantova for the Mantova Literature Festival, I performed amongst glass sculptures all over the place. He did not make stained glass. I thought it was like stained glass windows. Yeah. No, 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 no. He made sculptures. Wow. Stained, Mazanendaba was a sculpture. Zenzele, the children, the fish eagle, the dolphin, all of it. They, they were on stage. How amazing is that? Mm -hmm. So every country I've been to, I've learned so much. And I wish that um, people in positions of power, when they travel to those countries, they should come back and implement and not go to those countries, make speeches, and come home. And that's, the, that's it, you know? So the same thing that has happened with us now, I think it must have been a premonition, because I cannot explain to you how this thing happened, what was driving me so much. For a long time, I've been wanting to adopt a tree, to have a storytelling tree in, 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 in the city of Etewini. I love my city. I love KZN. It's one of the most beautiful provinces in the whole of South Africa. And uh, when I travel in other countries, I, 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 then I fly home. And before the aeroplane lands, my heart does somersaults because I love the beauty of my country. I finally found a tree in a park at the Bluff Showgrounds. And I went to ask the city of Etewini for permission so that our organization, the Namasego Arts and Heritage Trust, can use the space. It was a rigmarole getting permission. And eventually we got a yes. So from the first week of August 2019, we started doing an event because we wanted to do an event once a month, once a month under the tree. Can you imagine starting um, an, uh, the, the, this tradition of telling stories under a storytelling tree? Yes. It's like going back in time. Yes. Before there was a courthouse, there was a tree. Mm. Before there was a church, there was a tree. Yes. Before there was the, the most expensive concert hall, there was a tree. Before, people met in most glamorous places, uh, uh, fell in love. Oh, baby, I love you. I love you. Lovers met under a tree. And people made discussions and promises under the tree. And they sh so it was like going back in time. And so once a month, we did events. 
And in January, we went to America for another, um, another partnership with the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. I've been very lucky to be one of the artists in residence at the Gardner Museum in Boston. Yes. And then um, I went with my daughter. We performed together. I perform with my daughter quite a bit these days, and I love it. And we came back to South Africa just in time before lockdown. Yay, yay, yay. Mm -hmm. And we came back in February. We did a big celebration of International Mother Tongue Day, which we do, we do every year on the 21st of February. Yes. Every year. So under the storytelling tree we went. And then in March, we did uh, the Spirit of Light, where we honor people who do positive things in society. We went and we were invited to host it at the ICC Durban. Ha! Mm -hmm. huh? Two weeks later, <laughs> lockdown. Yeah can't do anything and all kinds of things got to be like on hold and we had to go back to the to the drawing board what are we gonna do and we thought hey gadgets most hey online platforms man what's that zoom 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 what's that facebook what's that instagram here we are i said these gadgets are not to be feared yes. they can partner with us so we went under the storytelling tree with a minimal audience and performed and filmed all of that and put them on our um, online platforms. So every month we did something. We did something under the storytelling tree. And now, whether you wanted social distancing or you wanted ventilation, under the African skies, under a beautiful wild fig tree, that's enough space for social distancing. There's enough space to breathe the fresh air. And we sanitized, we did the temperature reading, we did the, the, the writing down of the addresses and contacts so that we know who gets what. Yeah, we, fo we followed all the rules of the, the COVID-19 regulations, but we were outdoors under a storytelling tree. And we continued, continued. Other people were waiting for theaters to open. Whew, other people were waiting for stadia to open, waiting for, no, 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 we, we, we're busy under a tree. So we did all these events throughout 2020 under a tree. And slowly other people wanted to perform at my house because I've got a, a, a peace garden at my house. There's enough space for a jazz band to perform. So we started having jazz concerts as well at my house. And so it's been fascinating, it's been very fascinating to be alive and, and, and grateful under lockdown, under the times of COVID-19, and also to, to be versatile, yeah. to be versatile. So young people are fascinated by what we are doing mm -hmm. because the young people were thinking, under a tree, like, what's going on? <laughs> what do you mean? You know how fancy I am, you know how famous I am, you know? <laughs> so the International Rotary Club sent people to present the, um, the, 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 this amazing, amazing award, an international award under the storytelling tree. Who's ever heard of an international award presented under a storytelling tree? So if that tree could speak one of these days, it will tell many stories. Yeah. So I'm, I'm grateful. I always say to people, I, I live on vitamin G. Mm -hmm. That's vitamin gratitude. Yes. To be alive sitting here with you having this conversation, mm -hmm. having so many stories to tell, yes. to have had this journey, and to be blessed with good health. Mm -hmm. It is a blessing. Yes. It's not because, oh, I'm doing anything right. The Almighty has been good with me. Mm -hmm. Yes, but also maybe the genes from my family. But also, I don't just eat anything. Mm -hmm. I take care of my health, I take care of my body, and alcohol can chill over there, all the ganjas and other things can chill. I'm taking <laughs> care of myself. It's very, very important, because the Almighty can give you good health, and you eat all kinds of things, and oil, and a what, and a what, and too much salt, and all oh, fast foods, and all of these things, and then you don't know how come you're visiting the doctor so often. Yeah, true. So I'm, I'm living on vitamin gratitude, and um, opportunities like these to be having this conversation with you is something humbling. It's something to be um, not only proud, but also grateful for, yes, yes. Uh, to be able to, to have these conversations, extremely important. And to talk about um, this country that we love so much, yes. about the heritage that we share with different parts of the world, mm -hmm. and uh, knowing that we can share with them, because the operative word in my work is sharing and learn from other people, but I don't have to be a carbon copy of anybody else. I don't have to be like anyone else at all. I stay me, be you, full, just me, the daughter of Africa.
Lastly, as we conclude, Dr. Kunam Flope, do you feel that art is a way of self-exploration or spirituality, or can it be the two? It is both. Definitely self-expression and um, also very, very spiritual. If I did not believe in the power of the Almighty and the power of my ancestral heritage, I would not be the person that I am. Yeah, We always have to do that. And um, sometimes people choose a certain, um, a certain religion mm. to the detriment of their cultural heritage. Yes, yes. And I think that's a great pity mm. when you don't have a sense of who you are and you end up being an air plant. You can float for a certain amount of time. Even eagles who fly highest in the sky, they've got to land sometimes. Yes. They need to eat, they need to drink water, which is not up in the sky. They need to walk on the ground. Mother Nature expects them to do that. And so for me, um, our creative arts, cultural expression, and a sense of um, expressing yourself, and also connecting with other people. I always say there are invisible threads yeah. that make us connect with, with each other. And uh, those invisible threads connect us to one another, even though we are still in this um, here and now, but also in the future realm, and also in the, in, in the space where the creator of all things um, resides, the creator who's everywhere all around us. I don't know if you know Birago Diop from Senegal. You ever heard of Birago Diop? He did something very, very special. He wrote a poem about death. And when he talks about death, he always says, uh, listen more often to things than to human beings. Those who have died have never left. They are not beneath the ground. They are with us all the time. They are in the rustling trees. They are in the howling wind. They are in the thickening shadows. They are in the leaping flame. They are in the burning ember. They are in the child's first cry. They are in the woman's breast. They are in the gurgling waters of the river on its journey to the welcoming arms of the ocean. Listen more often to things than to human beings. Those who have died have never left. They are with us all the time. And I think about that poem so often in these times of COVID, mm -hmm. both um, India and South Africa. Yes. We've lost so many people. There's been so much lack of closure because of the nature of the beast, mm -hmm. coronavirus. Um, we, we haven't had enough time to say goodbye to the people we love. We haven't had time to be together, to embrace one another. We haven't had um, uh, space. To, 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 to cry and mourn and rejuvenate and feel the presence of those who are gone living with us again. And so all of those things. So we, we, we've gone through a lot and, and it's not over yet. It's not over yet. We're still in the throes of the storm, this, um, this COVID, uh, re-manifesting itself in different ways. But we, in the creative arts, we, the preservers of heritage, we are called we are in a space where we need to help each other and ourselves to heal. And healing is a constant and a continuous process. It's not start and finish. Yes. Most definitely. This has been episode nine of Uhamulami, My Journey. I was featuring Dr. Dinam Shope. Thank you so much for watching and enjoy the festive season. Wow, thank you so much, ma'am, and Dr. G, for that very interesting uh, journey of sharing your experiences with us. We got to learn so much, how beautiful, so profound, so info uh, insightful, and quite inspiring and motivating as well. I'm sure you enjoyed this episode of Huamo Alami, my journey, as much as we did. Please allow me to welcome Mr. Sipiwe Mchunu from the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban to render this evening's vote of thanks. Namaskar, greetings to all of you. On behalf of Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban, I am honored today to deliver a vote of thanks on our program, Uhambolami episode nine. Allow me to thank our online guest who took part on today's program. Ms. Trina Mshope, an author, poet, playwright, 
director, performer, and storyteller who had their wonderful interactions with Mr. Toki Mohoto, a social activist. You know, when I was listening to Mama Upti Nam Shope, you know, it, it was very informative. And Mama Sigbonga Kulu Nakogonke Okshilo and Sialia Zikaza also Lalile and the many York actor and the many in Kondro. Sibonga Kulu would see Benawe. We have learned a lot from these interactions that you had this evening. Siabonga to Toki Mohotoji Baba, as always, thank you very much. We really enjoyed it the uh, interactions that you conducted this evening. To director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, Mr. Piyush Kandelwal, Ms. Sristi Harinarayan, thank you very much for taking part on today's program. To all our online participants, we'd like to say thank you for being with us this evening. For more information on SVCC uh, cultural activities, please visit ICCR in Deben Facebook page. Once again, to Ms. Dina Mshop, Siabonga Mama, Sbonga Kulu, Sbonga Kulu, Sbonga Zanja Zombiligu, and also to Ubaba Utoki Mohoto, Siabonga Se, thank you very much for conducting such a wonderful interaction. So, to all of you, have a wonderful evening. Namaskar.